Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome to uh, Hassan Institute. And uh, uh, my name is uh, Miles Yu. I'm a senior fellow and director of the China Center here at Hassan. And uh, it is my um, uh, distinct uh, pleasure to welcome all of you here for the panel discussion of uh, senior fellow Thomas uh, Dusterberg's uh, uh, latest study, China's Econ Economic we Weakness and Challenges to the Bretton Woods System. How should the U.S. respond? Uh, you may find copies um, of uh, this uh, excellent report located on the side table or uh, at your seat. Um, to this panel discussion, we'll focus on China's current economic and geopolitical crisis and the findings of Dr. Dusterberg's study for how the U.S. can leverage these developments to continue China's aggressive challenge to the uh, Western-led world order. Before we begin in the program, let me uh, take a few minutes to introduce uh, our um, distinguished panelists, uh, each of whom brings a wealth of knowledge and uh, considerable expertise to the table. Uh, we have with us today Hudson Senior Fellow and author of this report, Dr. Thomas Dusterberg, sitting over there. Um, you, I think there should be a television show, it's called Everybody Loves Tom. Uh, 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 he's a very um, uh, well-respected uh, authority. Uh, Tom uh, has a long and distinguished career as an expert on trade, manufacturing, economics, and foreign policy. Previously, he was uh, executive director of the Manufacturing and Society in the 21st Century Program at the Aspen Institute from 1999 to, to 2011. Uh, he served as president and CEO of the Manufacturers Alliance, uh, MAPI, an economic research and executive education organization based in Virginia. He was also director of the Washington office of the Hudson Institute, assistant secretary for international economic policy at the U.S. Department of Commerce, chief of staff to Representative Chris Cox and uh, to Senator Dan Quayle of Indiana. And uh, he was associate instructor at the Stanford University as well. He's the author of four books and uh, well over 300 articles in journals and uh, major news outlets. He's on the board of advisors of the Manufacturing Public Policy Institute at the Indiana University and uh, the board of trustees of the American University of Rome. Also with us today is Dr. Peter Hofele and he's gonna be online, um, virtual, and he's a director, uh, he's policy director of the uh, Martin Center for European Studies in Brussels. Dr. Horfele is an <laughs> expert in the field of economic policy, international development, cooperation, and energy uh, policy. He has, he has previously worked as an economic researcher at the Institute for Economy and Society in Bonn and joined the Conrad Adenauer uh, uh, Stifton KAS in 2003, first as a head of the Department of Economic Education before continuing on as director of the China office of the KAS from 2010 to 2015. He is director of the regional project Energy Security and Climate Change based in Hong Kong from 2015 to 2019, and as a director of the Department for Asia and the Pacific at the KAS in Berlin from 2019 to 2021. Next, we have uh, uh, Leland Miller, who's sitting uh, here next uh, uh, to me, and he's a co-founder and CEO of China Beige Book. Uh, Leland is a, a noted authority on China's economic and the financial system whose work is regularly featured in the Wall Street Journal, New York Times, and the Atlantic, for, the Atlantic and the Foreign Policy, among many others, and frequently contributing uh, commentary to CNBA, CNBC, Bloomberg, CNN, and Fox Business. He's also an elected member of the National Committee on U.S.-China Relations and the Economic Club of New York, elected a life member of the Council on Foreign Relations, and a non-resident senior fellow at the Scowcroft Center at Atlantic Council. Prior to co-founding China Beige Book in 2010, Leland was the capital market attorney based out in New York and Hong Kong. And rounding out the panel, we have Craig Singleton. Uh, 
He was de his deputy director and a senior fellow at the Foundation for Defense of Democracy, FDD, uh, China program. Um, he's uh, 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 also um, there. Uh, Craig is an expert on great power competition with China and has over a decade of service in several national security roles in, with the United States government focused on East Asia. He has regularly briefed federal law enforcement, US military personnel, foreign government, congressional oversight committees, and the White House on issues related to China's overseas military expansion, coercion operations, and North Korea. Craig's work is featured regularly in the Wall Street Journal, Foreign Policy, The Hill, CNBC, Fox News, and many other outlets. Please join me in welcoming our distinguished panel. Uh, before we turn uh, uh, to our slate of uh, questions, I'd like to uh, invite Dr. Tom um, uh, Dusterberg to provide some opening commentary on his newest study, China's Economic Weakness and the Challenge to the Bretton Woods System. How should the U.S. respond? Tom? Okay. Thank you, Miles. Um, and thanks to... Uh, Peter in Brussels, uh, Leland and Craig here for be, being willing to go through such a long paper and be willing to, to, to comment in this public forum. And welcome to all of our uh, uh, audience uh, online. Um, my basic argument is that the Chinese economy has reached a point where it can no longer grow even at high single digit rates and address at the same time many, the many structural problems that are a political challenge to the leadership of the Chinese Communist Party. I further argue that China could be subject to negative growth or even, uh, an acute financial crisis um, because of the growing financial stress um, in China. And I just note, uh, reading the papers this morning, um, a few more indicators, live indicators of this financial stress. We have the uh, Zhang Ji. Uh, uh, shadow bank uh, about to collapse, which will deal a major blow to investor confidence. Uh, the uh, governor of the People's Bank of China, Pan Gongsheng, at a speech yesterday said, certain financially weaker regions in the west and north of the country <coughs> may have, and I quote, difficulty serv servicing local government debts. Um, and finally, Bloomberg carried an article uh, on the, the banking system in China, which indicated that uh, uh, because of the squeeze put on by Beijing for uh, the banking system to bail out the real estate sector, uh, their average uh, uh, margin um, in their op operations is down close to 1%. Uh, there's over $420 billion recognized of, of uh, bad debt on their books already. So the Chinese economy, and especially its banks and local governments, uh, which are responsible for over 85% of public expenditures, are so overleveraged that it cannot safely issue enough more debt to stimulate the economy. Infrastructure spending, the other traditional way to promote growth, and investment in state-owned enterprises are both highly inefficient uh, due to overbuilding and very low returns on new capital investment. Local governments can no longer rely on selling land for real estate development to meet shortfalls in their budgets. Uh, domestic real estate is cratering, as everyone knows, and numerous bonds financing the sector have already gone into default. Uh, the lion's share of these so far are dollar bonds sold in part to foreign buyers. But major, major portions of the Chinese investments abroad through the Belt and Road Program uh, which incidentally are largely in uh, dollar denominated, are also in trouble with, uh, with large infrastructure structure projects funded by BR failing and government borrows and borrowers in the global south in severe stress. The problems of Chinese banks in rolling over distressed dollar debts especially puts them at further risks. Uh, overinvestment has continued to produce excess supplies of manufactured products we all know about steel autos and now electric vehicles, solar panels, and other products which the Chinese are dumping in foreign markets. Uh, the problems of local government finance are causing excessive precautionary savings among Chinese households, which undermines uh, Xi's program 
to shift from foreign to domestic consumption to drive growth in China. In these circumstances, I, I argue that China is highly reliant on foreign capital and foreign markets for sustainable growth and inability to increase revenues internally to meet difficult domestic challenges of an aging population, inadequate pensions and medical care, and environmental degradation, amongst others, not to speak of the failure to deliver housing units paid for in advance by uh, mortgaged households, all are causing sporadic political discontent as seen in mortgage strikes, popular opposition to COVID lockdowns, and deterioration of public services. Uh, the charm offensive that led to the Xi-Biden photo ops this month is recognition by Xi that he needs Western help to turn around the, his economy. So I argue that these problems give American and allied policymakers the opportunity to exercise some leverage to convince Chinese leadership to change its mercantilist policies and its programs to undermine the U.S.-led Bretton Woods economic order. Uh, China's aggressive use of these programs is a challenge to economic and political vitality in the United States and allies and for the post-World War II uh, geopolitical order. To uh, push back against China policies, I outline a number of steps aimed at taking advantage of their economic vulnerabilities. Um, first, continued deployment of aggressive trade, trade measures first put into place by the Biden administration and continued for the most part by the Biden team, put in place at first by the Trump administration, I should have said. Uh, uni unilateral measures such as the use of Section 301 and national security related tools, as well as the use of WTO rules where they can win allied support and have a chance to be successful, should also be deployed. Uh, to, to limit Chinese ability to acquire sensitive technology and win support for its financial recovery, I urge expansion of both inward and outward bound investment controls, including, including broader use of limits on portfolio investment in Chinese companies involved in its military and surveillance state in sensitive areas like uh, AI and quantum or connected uh, industries connected to exploitative and abusive labor and environmental practices uh, such as uh, is being practiced in Xinjiang internally or in some African and South Asian states. <clears throat> in terms of export controls, I urge continuing targeted but comprehensive export control measures, especially those related to national security and critical dual-use technologies such as semiconductors and aerospace. Um, I propose broader use of financial sanctions on Chinese banks or affiliated global banks, uh, where appropriate, which are implicated in illicit fa financing of weapons and drug trade, or for the money laundering, which facilitates a broad spectrum of trade, including drug trafficking, the evasion of sanctions on <clears throat> pariah states such as Iran, North Korea, and Russia. I also argue about, uh, against the possible use of uh, Treasury or Fed resources to supplement China's attempt to win tacit Western support for its fault faltering financial sector. I note that in the news recently, and since I uh, completed this report, the uh, uh, cryptocurrency uh, exchange Binance has pleaded guilty to a vast variety, a variety of suspicious transactions uh, amongst the one and a half billion million or so transactions that they processed. Um, Chinese banks have to be complicit in uh, much of this, uh, much of these illicit trade with um, actors such as Hamas, ISIS, um, uh, let alone the Iranian oil and Russian supplies. Um, Finally, to combat China's efforts to undermine the Bretton Woods system, I argue for strengthening U.S. efforts uh, with allies to the extent possible to provide alternatives to China's Belt and Road Initiative and its development financing. It's the biggest uh, development financer uh, in the world now. Um, and also uh, alternatives to its attempts to undermine and replace the dollar in international transactions and its efforts to dominate raw materials uh, and uh, vital to the modern economy, the supply chains of the modern economy. 
developing a network of regional trade agreements in cooperation with allies on supply chain resilience are the starting point for this effort of pushback. Uh, ex excluding China from these programs, absent a, absent a change in their policies, is also part of the strategy. Maintaining stable currencies and trade settlement and payment systems, as well as cracking down on illicit Chinese efforts to bypass use of these tools through the use of digital currencies and cryptocurrency, uh, is another component. Finally, strengthening the Paris Club and cooperating with allies in general on development finance are all means to offer better alternatives to developing countries and non-aligned trading partners to avoid joining China's alternative global institutes, institutions such as the BRICS or the Shanghai Cooperation Organization. So let me stop there and I look forward to uh, comments by my distinguished uh, colleagues. Uh, thank you, Tom. So um, our um, panelists have read uh, Tom's report. So I'd like to um, ask each one of them to uh, provide the, their overall commentary on this report. Uh, each one of them would have uh, up to five minutes. So let's go, let's start with uh, um, uh, Lilian, and then um, Dr. Uh, Hofele, and then uh, Craig. Uh, I think uh, Tom has done us a great service by putting together a compendium of all the various things that need, we need to be worried about from a policymaking standpoint in terms of China. It's a long report. It's filled with a lot of great detail. Now, I have three to five minutes to, over, uh, to overview a, a handful of points. What I'd like to do is say, what's the next step to this? And the next step is to have intense focus on a handful of issues that really count. I think the biggest problem with US-China policy for years and years and years has been that maybe people inside the Beltway are instinctively uh, cautious on China, they may be sufficiently hawkish on China, but they don't know where to focus their efforts. And so all we get is just a spaghetti on the wall constantly, this policy, that policy, let's focus on everything at once. No, what you need to do is focus on three, four, five priorities that are really moving the needle priorities in the relationship. Some examples of what I do not think are move the needle. One, de-dollarization. And, and keep in mind here, I'm being intentionally provocative because Tom and I agree on almost everything in terms of the economy, so I gotta figure out some ways to, to push back on it. Uh, look, a, a de-dollarization, it, it's not a worry for us, it's in, at least in the medium term. To the extent it's a worry, it's gonna be based on the United States itself doing some things it shouldn't. China is not pushing for global reserve currency. This includes a digital yuan, which is much misunderstood. There is no move for China to take over status or even make the yuan a major reserve currency. It is worried about US sanctions. It is worrying about at the margins making the yuan more transactional from, from an international payment standpoint in order to be able to fight any future sanctions it sees. But de-dollarization is not something we should be terribly worried about right now. Number two, security organizations. I know there is a lot of angst about the BRICS, about the SCO, for instance, Shanghai Cooperation Organization. Uh, but these are acronyms, not active organizations. Uh, I was reminded very recently that back in 2003, I wrote the first economic analysis the Shanghai Cooperation Organization ever done. Uh, no, one, no one read this paper, except maybe my parents. Uh, 2003, I was very bearish on the prospects for anything happening with the SCO over the next 20, 30 years. I was, in retrospect, far too bullish. I think the SCO is an empty organization. I think the BRICS is an empty organization. These guys don't agree on anything. They're never going to get their act together to do anything. To the extent they do something, it will be things that would already have been done on a bilateral basis, like upping the amount of yuan being transacted in bilateral trade. That'll happen anyways. I don't think that these organizations are worth worrying about. Number three, international lending. Uh, another thing that gets people really fired up, particularly in DC, are the idea that the Chinese are lending out money to the world and there's debt, you know, you know, debt diplomacy and all kinds of other things, hard power, soft power. Look, the Chinese are good at a lot of things. One thing they are not good at is investing efficiently. And that applies domestically, as we see. We, you read Tom's paper, you see, certainly see all the problems with the domestic economy right now. But it's even double so when they're investing out uh, in, into the world. 
into Africa, into Central Asia, you know, into Latin America. These are some of the worst investments they've been parked in. It doesn't mean that the United States shouldn't be closely watching individual projects, individual investments. But in terms of us, you know, creating some big ball of capital to go out there and compete with the Chinese for some for some some projects, um, you know, so that so that we have you know skin in the game, we should not be focusing on that whatsoever. It's not a worry. Let the Chinese inefficiently invest internationally and to their detriment. Uh, Three things, though, that I think that we should be focusing on, since I know this is not much time. The first is export controls. Uh, export controls are not an economic issue in the US-China relationship. They are the economic issue in the relationship. And the problem we've had so far is that there's all these headlines about export controls being pushed. The United States is actively working to decouple or to ring fence the Chinese from advanced technology. None of that is actually happening. And the reason for this is there are announcements about what's, you know, what we're doing, but the issue is complex. People are not focused enough on this issue because they have all these other issues, and, and they don't understand that very little is actually happening. There are very few things that our export controls actually prohibit right now. What is mostly happening is there is a licensing system in which companies that are, that are, that are, uh, are, are told they can't do something can apply for a license and then Commerce Department, with no sense of transparency at all, approves, more often than not, approves, approves a license. You know, you have an investment screening mechanism that started off as a reverse CFIUS and ended up turning into a notification system that's completely useless because it's about this narrow and carves out anyone who doesn't have 50% of their investment in, you know, in, in, in AI company, in, in, in AI, you know, they're, they're carved out. If you don't have a military end user, they're carved out. There's no way we have the ability uh, to, 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 to figure out who is a military end user, who's not. And if we did, this is China. Everyone's a potential military end user if they can be co-opted by the government. So the problem here is that we're saying we're doing things and we're not taking them seriously. Two, two more uh, quickly uh, without going over my time limit. The second is investment flows. Uh, an enormous amount of active and passive investment goes from U.S funds, U.S. taxpayers into China, we have no idea where it's going. We have no idea where it's going. Some of it goes to help the party, some of it goes to help the military. The first thing we should do is identify where these funds are going, and then we should be crafting thoughtful rules in terms of ring-fencing investment flows that are going to actors in the economy that we don't want them to, particularly, of course, the People's Liberation Army. The last, I don't have to say a lot on it, supply chains. A quick comment on this, I get into a room quite often with people very fired up about China, and they say, well, we just need to decouple. You know, day one, the next president needs to walk in the room and just decouple from China. And my answer to that is, well, what about pharmaceuticals? I said, what are you talking about? Well, what is our vulnerability to Chinese and other countries' uh, provision of pharmaceutical inputs if we're talking about cutting off, uh, cutting off coupling, cutting off supply chains? What's the issue here? Well, we have no idea. They have no idea. We don't have enough insight into what our supply chain vulnerabilities are to be able to make policy the way we need to over the coming years. So I simply say we need to pay more attention to that, and we need to pay more attention to the other two issues. And uh, let me stop there. Well, thank you, Leland. Um, so next, uh, Dr. Peter uh, uh, Heffley, Heffley uh, from uh, Belgium. Yes, Mike, uh, thank you very much. And Thomas and all the colleagues of the Arts Institute, um, welcome from Brussels. Um, it's a follow up of our fruitful discussions we had a couple of weeks ago in Brussels, our traditional transatlantic dialogue between the Hudson and the Martin Center. Um, I'm honored and very pleased to share some thoughts on this important and impressive paper. And I will do it uh, from a European perspective, or to be more precise, to do it. Uh, for the purpose to see where Europe stands and what it means for our transatlantic relations. And the questions, Thomas, you raised are not only questions in relation to China. I think there are much more fundamental questions about our international trade order, which has, are at stake. Well, let me start with the observation that, unfortunately, Europe has failed to contribute very much to a stronger international trade organization, despite being the second largest trading bloc um, for too long. Trade policy has never been seen as a major tool also of power protection. It was something in a little box of economic considerations, but it had never been put into any closer consideration with other policies from defense policy to development policy. And for that, 
uh, we have not unleashed the full power of a trading block as the uh, European Union. And secondly, we lost uh, the momentum because we had been on the other side, surprisingly, too ambitious. We created a lot of complex trade agreements and that came at the price of being at a snail pace over last years. And we missed a lot of opportunities as Europeans to imprint our norms on economic relations and trade relations with other nations. We are currently in the danger of creating a new type of protectionism, um, which is not uh, induced by the threat imposed by China, but for other reasons, for example, in this green transformation period we are currently undergoing, we try to protect European markets from unfair competition, but also it's a lot of greenwashing and we do a lot in social and environmental regulations and the problem of supply chains has already been mentioned. It is even from that point of view impossible to fully trace them back. So we're creating a fence around Europe instead of becoming an active part of an open and still globalized uh, society and trade market. Then the topics of investment, um, screening, anti-coercion issues. Yes, we have instruments now recently created and we have not tested them yet. So I have great doubts whether this will be really applicable because we have such a diversity of interest among European member states that it will be very difficult to apply in an efficient way. And then all those who are dealing with China on a daily basis uh, know these arguments of these cloudy promises by China of contributing to such uh, things as we call global goods, such as climate change or public health. Um, this is something which still resonates largely in Europe, and this is why we still engage very much with China. I have never seen any convincing example of any joint efforts. Um, on the contrary, for example, in this process of green transformation in Europe, we got even more dependent on China in the sectors um, of solar panels, for example, or electric batteries. So instead of being able to create our champions, we now are much more either in more dependent relations or we do it by massive subsidies and protectionist measures. So quite the contrary of what we, what we are standing for. The most efficient way in my understanding is if it comes to reducing dependencies in making clear to the big players in particular in Europe that the state is no longer willing to bail out high risk strategies. Um, even basic standards of due diligence are apparently not yet applied to investments in China. Surprisingly, the small and medium sized enterprises in Europe are much more aware of the challenges than the big fishes such as the automotive industry. So this has to be a clear signal from the policy side that we are not willing to support any risks taking over for many and too many decades. Um, it has been mentioned before that it's very difficult to define where our vulnerabilities lies. And I think in this respect, we can learn much from Japan, which has a very elaborated strategy in economic analysis. And we have to close this huge strategic gap between the business and the politics. The, these are still two worlds too far apart in many ways. Tom, you mentioned the issue, how shall we deal with international organizations such as the United Nations or the WTO? I'm very skeptical, frankly speaking, about the reform of such institutions. My suggestion is to go more into regional and interregional alliances, in particular those regions which are very close also culturally to us. This is in the case of Europe, for example, Northern Africa or Latin America. There's a lot of potential and we have not fully exploited it. Um, and of course, if you look into the economic and political leadership in Europe, um, which I don't see for the moment, by the way, um, we have not yet created a much, a much leverage, both in our economic and uh, political transformations. We have not yet the sticks uh, to really come up against China, and we are still very much bound to our old throttle passes. There's not much innovation despite all the many papers and considerations about a new China strategy. We in the transatlantic and North Atlantic region have a unique opportunity now because also unfortunately in Europe, the anti-European and the anti-transatlantic forces are very much growing. We will see it in the next year's election in June 20, 
2024. So we have now an opportunity to create and to join our forces. And this is my main message. Take the opportunity and create a common understanding and common instruments. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Nay, Craig. Sure, thank you so much uh, for having me and uh, Tom for putting all this work into this paper. As I was reading it, I was sort of reminded of the principal paradox of Washington's approach towards China today, which primarily, from my view, lies in its sort of unanticipated consequences. You know, far from mitigating Beijing's brashness, all of these diplomatic overtures that we've seen over the last year have emboldened Xi further. And I really do think that appeasing this sort of aggression today really does risk miscalculation and potentially even catastrophe tomorrow. I think APEC revealed that policymakers here in Washington are interested in pursuing a path towards detente. A lot of the language that we heard from Xi Jinping himself about the world is big enough for the two of us is eerily reminiscent of what we even heard from Khrushchev during the Cold War about peaceful coexistence, right? Even the the Biden administration's China policy is rooted in an idea of competing while coexisting. It, it assumes a policy of detente. And so I think as much as I've sort of uh, had concerns or reservations about comparisons to the Cold War with the Soviet Union, I do think it's important that we recognize that detente as a policy failed. Uh, you know, we did fool ourselves a little bit into thinking that the US and Soviet systems could coexist. And so we pursued policies that, you know, were aimed, I think, at stability, but counterintuitively extended the Soviet system's survival. Uh, and so I think today, because of all of the headwinds that Tom outlines in his paper, Xi Jinping really welcomes detente. It provides the necessary breathing room that he needs both to address the structural, not cyclical, structural problems in China's economy, problems that he has talked about since his first day atop the Chinese Communist Party, but also to build out this alternate global architecture, one that reflects China's values and I think China's interests. And nowhere is that clearer to me, at least, than in the economic realm. And so I do think that while the paper does an excellent job of outlining all of the suite of policy tools that are available to us, the real next step, and I think Leland touched on this too, is not only to identify where we're going to prioritize, but first maybe what are our desired end states in the US-China relationship, which as far as I'm concerned haven't been articulated by this administration and perhaps even by the last administration. Um, some of those endpoints were nebulous. They were unclear to outside observers. As far as I think about the current state of the US-China relationship and where things are going so long as Xi Jinping remains in power is really thinking about employing these tools to promote change in Chinese conduct, right? That has to be the principal, one of the principal objectives here, showing that the costs outweigh the potential gains. And because, and I think Leland touched on this expertly, we have export controls, but we actually don't enforce export controls. Export controls as they exist don't, don't even achieve their, their small, minimal desired end state. And so we have to start to impose serious costs on the Chinese, and we can do so today, I think, while pressure testing the notion that China's slowing economy will somehow boomerang on us. I think, I think we're at a moment now where we maybe we need to reflect upon whether a slowing China means a slowing in the United States. And I'm not sure that that long-held assumption really bears out in the economic data that we see today, as flawed as the data is that we get out of China, and I would suspect conditions are even worse than we know. The second sort of desired end state, at least as I'm, for, I'm concerned, is maximizing our restraining leverage over Beijing um, as a means to control China's behavior. This is another area where I haven't, I haven't seen too much written about how we can employ this suite of tools and how you sequence those tools to get restraining leverage, weaponized interdependence, uh, as much as we joke about mirroring the Chinese and how they approach the United States. I think there's a lot to be said about some lessons that we can be learning about the value of maintaining some of that interconnectedness in ways that are beneficial to us. The third is, and I think hearing the European perspective is so important, is creating this long-term Western consensus on how to deal with China, which to me 
We're in the very, very early stages of that conversation, even here in Washington. But as we travel abroad and talk to partners in Europe, but particularly in Southeast Asia, um, I don't get the sense that there is a, that the consensus really exists yet. The fourth goal, at least from my perspective, is a renewed focus on reciprocity, which is very, very absent from our current dealings with the Chinese. I think even if you look at some of the announcements that came out of APEC, the decision to remove um, a designation on an entity deeply involved in the fentanyl trade in the hopes that the Chinese one day will work with us on fentanyl uh, sort of demonstrates this lack of reciprocity. Uh, and I do think there are a lot of lessons learned, particularly from Re the Reagan administration, about reasserting reciprocity into our relationship to push China along towards where we want to go. And I think the fifth sort of objective for me is to really signal to China and to China's leadership that genuine changes in behavior could lead to improved east-west relations. But it's very important that we don't confuse symmetry and uh, symbolism with substance. And I think a lot of the coverage out of APEC confused both observers, but also I think policymakers here that we were somehow entering a period of perhaps stability or thaw in the China, with our relationship with Beijing. When I, I suspect just the opposite will happen. Both sides are so calcified and entrenched and haven't given any indication of real change or movement on key core issues that we're going to just continue to see a deterioration there. And paramount to that task, I think, for, for us, really, as we're thinking through attacking maybe some of those economic pillars of Chinese society that we assess we have leverage over today and might not have leverage over tomorrow, is really ensuring that east-west relations or US-China relations do not facilitate China's military buildup. And Leland touched on this, and Tom touches on this a lot in the paper. The capital flows to entities in China's so-called commercial sector that are deeply entrenched with China's military industrial complex are areas where both in the Cold War, Reagan administration, and today, we really do need to accurately assess those, those flows and, the, uh, and perhaps how they could be inadvertently, or even knowingly, advancing China's <coughs> military buildup. I think we also need to make sure we don't take any steps at all to sort of ease the burden of these resource allocation decisions that Beijing is facing today. As their economy slows, as they confront these massive debt loads, as they confront an aging workforce, this wave of challenges that they see coming, they're going to have to start to make some hard decisions about where some of these resources go. And I don't think we should make or take any steps that ease the burden for them to have to decide between winners and losers, which when China is growing at 14% growth, there aren't, everyone wins, right? Everyone gets a piece of the pie, but as the pie gets smaller, I do suspect that there are going to be opportunities to force winners and losers um, that could shake some core pillars of Chinese society in ways that I think the Chinese themselves are quite nervous about. How do you, how do you sort of handle those trade-offs? And last, I think, is we must ensure to the maximum extent possible that we minimize the potential for structural leverage that the Chinese have over us. I think the paper does an excellent job, particularly focusing on the electric vehicle and lithium uh, ion battery industry. It's a topic that we recently wrote about at FDD, looking at Chinese company Cattle, or CATL. These are companies with deep, close ties to the Chinese Communist Party leadership that, through a wide body of Chinese laws, are beholden to the Chinese Communist Party. And in many, I think, instances reminiscent of Huawei and the challenges that those of us in government fought against the Huawei threat um, pose an immediate and undeniable sort of cybersecurity threat to our way of life. And so we have to start to be thinking through what this next wave of emerging technology is, where the Chinese are leading, which EVs is no doubt one of them, and starting to ask ourselves whether we, and I hate to say it, want to watch the same movie again. The movie that we watched with Huawei infiltration into 5G networks, DJI infiltration into our drone systems, TikTok as a social media platform. We find ourselves, I think, again, in that industry at a, at a moment of, of strong uh, consideration for what's next and whether we need to take steps today to prevent them from having structural leverage over us. 
Great. So uh, thank you very much for uh, all of you for your um, very um, uh, insightful comments on Tom's uh, research. So I'm going to give you, uh, Tom, uh, up to five minutes to respond in uh, overall. Okay, I'll try to. Be, before we turn to the Q&A. Try to be less than five. Um, uh, Leland, I think, rightfully emphasizes that some of the efforts that the Chinese are making to, for instance, de-dollarize uh, international transactions uh, or to undermine um, um, uh, Western, what I generally call Bretton Woods institutions, such as the, the BRICS and the Shanghai Co Cooperation Council. I agree with Leland, those are not being successful. Um, but one of the th reasons I spent a lot of time on that is that because it, it indicates to me a couple of things. One, that uh, China actually wants to decouple. I mean, I think they are serious about uh, these efforts, um, even though they're uh, not meeting with a lot of success yet. Uh, number two, they're desperate to immunize themselves against Western sanctions that we've uh, employed against North Korea, we've employed against uh, Russia with mixed success, I'll, I'll admit. But for instance, the, the uh, 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 the effort to get out from underneath um, the, the dollar as the, the medium of all international transactions, uh, I think is, is just an effort to, uh, in the long run, uh, reduce their dependency on, on um, uh, or their vulnerabilities to the West. Uh, and finally, I, I, I think the reason I spent a lot of time on uh, international uh, development finance, which is Chinese efforts, I think, are largely failing, um, or at least they're in a, in a lot of financial trouble, is because I think that further weakens the Chinese economy. And it, you know, my thesis is that they're they're uh, extremely weak, and therefore some of the vulnerabilities and the, the policy responses that I uh, mentioned to uh, try to exploit those vulnerabilities. I, I, that's why I spent a lot of time talking about uh, those sorts of things. Um, Peter, I think, um, uh, rightfully pointed out that uh, Europe is uh, still trying to um, develop a, a coherent uh, response to China and uh, uh, ways to work with us. And he uh, uh, mentioned the elections that are coming up uh, in uh, early and mid 2024 in Europe, which provide an opportunity, I think, for it, Europe internally um, to, cons to ha develop a more coherent, uh, not only relationship with us, but a, a policy towards China. So I'm hopeful that a number of factors um, operating in, in Europe, now, such as the uh, vulner vulnerabilities of Europe to electric vehicles and solar panels and wind equipment uh, coming from China will concentrate their minds um, on uh, and in, um, uh, incentivize them to work a little bit more with us on our China policy. Um, finally, uh, I think Craig is right to emphasize minimizing our dependence on China in, in as many ways as, uh, as we can. Um, um, so, and I, also I noted he used the term reciprocity, which is a sort of a fundamental um, principle of the World Trade Organization, which is honored in, in the breach. But if we honored that principle, then it would uh, give us at least the moral high ground to take a lot more uh, actions, trade actions against China. Uh, several of, uh, of the commentators mentioned the lack of a success of export controls, and, and I agree, and unfortunately the sanctions and export con controls that are being applied to Russia are not as uh, powerful as, and successful as they should be. But we have had some success, for instance, with Huawei. We at least shut down their uh, advanced um, fi 5G phone uh, uh, business um, I, I argue that we ought to take a more serious look at dual-use technologies. Um, these are very difficult politically. For instance, in the aerospace sector, which I mentioned, 
um, um, we, we are the dominant force in, in, for instance, commercial aviation, but China is nipping at our heels and now has um, a commercial airliner that at least they have um, certified for use. So, uh, but, you know, there's a military confrontation on looming in the distance and um, what we uh, provide to the Chinese commercial aviation sector goes straight into their military sector as well. So let me stop there. Oh, great. So um, before I turn the audience to, um, uh, 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 to some questions, uh, let me just uh, um, ask each of the panelists a very brief question. So hopefully uh, you can uh, um, uh, give a uh, sort of a concise uh, answer. Uh, first, uh, to Leland. Leland, you rightfully point out that China realized that it alone could not really um, overturn the international system led by, by the West. So it has to build um, uh, alliance. And so you mentioned about the BRICS and SCO. Um, I would also add uh, uh, um, AIAB. Uh, con uh, grouping like that is very important. And uh, you also uh, said that, uh, oh, they're just concept. They're not really that really successful, efficient. So uh, uh, let me just uh, 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 be the devil's advocate. Uh, uh, we can say, well, so are Quad and uh, AUKUS. I mean, they're just concept, right? They're not necessarily uh, alliance over there. Uh, the reason we're here talking about China in the last several years is because we have realized, historically, we have underestimated uh, the CCP, China. So uh, my question to you is, um, are we uh, repeating the past history of underestimating China's ambition, its uh, capability, and uh, its, uh, its potential? I do think we're continuing to underestimate Chinese ambition. I just don't think our attention should be focused on the international institutions. I think what China's gonna be able to do through these new international institutions is not much more than it would be able to do bilaterally in the absence of these institutions. They sound bad, they sound nefarious, but th what this does is when we, com we continue to focus on, on the scary threat down the road of these organizations, we, we don't look at the threat that's just directly in front of us. If you realize that, that we have been deeply deeply unserious about our export control process. We have been completely negligent on having any transparency whatsoever on investment flows coming from the US into China. We have been negligent on our supply chain vulnerabilities, and we've been quite negligent on just about everything that has to do with Taiwan. This is a prior priority game. So I, I, I'm not against identifying the potential you know, problems of, of, of Chinese you know, tangling up current international organizations creating their own, the friction it could cause. I'm not saying that they're nothing. I'm saying that we have a set of threats directly in front of us that we're not taking seriously. Those first. Oh, thank you very much. That sounds like a Seinfeld response. You know, it's not me, it's not you, it's me. You know, so, so, uh, the threat is there, but we are not doing enough to counter that threat. Uh, next question uh, 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 for uh, Peter in Brussels. Uh, if I may, um, I recently made two trips to Europe, uh, one to France, another one to Hungary. Uh, they have a very different uh, approaches about what's going on uh, in the world. Uh, but overall, with the um, very um, sort of a exception, um, exceptional um, reality of Hungary, uh, most of European countries, um, in light of the um, war in Ukraine, realize they have uh, uh, terrible over-reliance on Russia for energy and terrible over-reliance on China for trade, and most importantly, terrible re over-reliance on the United States for security. So they're trying to, trying to figure out some kind of a, uh, some kind of a response to that um, to strengthen its self-reliance. Um, Hungary, of course, is very different. Hungary has a uh, totally different approach. It believes that uh, it's going, uh, it has a very um, um, a different approach. Uh, it's ally with Russia, it's ally with China, and obviously uh, has a, a major security uh, um, uh, friction with the United States on some of the key issues uh, with regard to NATO. So Peter, I'm ask, uh, uh, the question for you is, uh, how do you think the Europeans um, will come up with a sort of more holistic uh, approach to the issue of China, uh, particularly in the realm of trade? And the, your EU overall strategy is uh, uh, China is a syst systemic rival. So to what extent Europeans are thinking um, systemically at this point? 
Yes, thank you very much. Um, I think the Russian aggression on Ukraine did a great job, if I may say so. It sounds a bit uh, sadly, but uh, this has really united Europe. It has clearly laid out the weak points. Um, it has speed up developments we have seen over the last five to seven years already. And in this respect, the European Commission, which is often blamed uh, for many things, for good or bad reasons, did a great job in, in unifying. It acquired a lot of competences, not necessarily written in the con in the Constitution of Europe, but de facto it got a lot of instruments at hand and it played it quite well. There is now a larger consensus indeed uh, on what China means for us. Um, we have for decades pledged for reciprocity. This uh, term has used very often. It never realized now we have learned that we have to really put this as a, a measurement in all our initiatives. And I don't see any meaningful uh, negotiations, for example, in the upcoming summit in Beijing in early December, there will be uh, almost no significant results because we do not see any opportunities any longer. We have to strengthen our own instruments. Again, it's the transatlantic relation that is our partners in the South and in the Southwest which we have to focus our political energy, such as, for example, the Mercosur area. This is where we still have a stick and we should not steer uh, so much to China. We should focus on our own strengths and instruments already there. So we have to play it much more skillful. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, last question to Craig is, uh, you mentioned this very important issue of the end game. What is this uh, end game uh, uh, during this uh, US-China uh, intense uh, engagement or competition right now? Um, and uh, I don't think there's a, a, a much confusion during the Trump administration, of which I'm always a member, because we knew this was uh, the relationship with China is not just about competition. Mm -hmm. um, it's really about the two models of governance, which one will prevail. So it's not just about economic competition, it's not about military competition, it's about the political economic system. We realize that the fundamental economic issue with China is not really about economics, it's about political, because China is fundamentally a non-market economy. You cannot really embrace China into the global free market-based economic system with a non-market economy. So ultimately, it's really, really, is, it's a, uh, in my view, it's a political uh, issue. Now, when we talk about competition, which is a very, very heavy emphasis uh, by this administration, they, they, in order to stress its seriousness, they added some words like a vigorous competition. I don't know what that means, you know. Me either. Uh, so, uh, uh, competition implicitly gave uh, China the qualification as a competitor. But competitor must agree to the same kind of rules of engagement. Competitor also means that you really agree there will be only one winner. There's no win-win, right? So that's why the competition with China is really about ideological and political. And uh, so that's, I think, is the end game. Um, uh, ultimately, is really how to preserve the system we already have and how China try to, uh, try to uh, uh, revert that. So um, my question to you is, uh, do you think that to what extent we should expand the spectrum of a competition with China to add a very strong dose of a political element to this. It's really not about just economic and military or even trade. It's just far beyond that. I, I think it has to be a central part of the equation. I think what's interesting when you go back, and I had a chance to help contribute to the, to the development of the Indo-Pacific strategy framework, right? During the last administration, I encourage everyone to go read it. It was the first chance I think we took, and I was a civil servant at the time, to reframe the conversation around China. But we still did so with China as a regional challenge, the Indo-Pacific, right? And I think even structurally within the government and the White House and the executive agencies, we still treat China like a regional challenge. If you go to the White House and you say, where, does China, where are China issues decided? It's East Asia. Well, China isn't just an East Asia problem. So structurally, we aren't addressing the challenge as a transnational threat, much in the way that we addressed counterterrorism. And so you should ask, one of the challenges, and I think Tom mentioned it, is Jake Sullivan is deeply involved in these issues, but he's one man, he has only so much time, there's a number of competing crises. If every issue on China, on tech and trade and tariffs and Taiwan, all are working up through a system that's adjudicated by that level, unfortunately, I think you end up with a lot of wheel spinning. And so I do think we're, we're due to sit back and restructure our systems to say, 
do we really have a technology directorate at the NSC if you take the China issue out of it? And I would argue you maybe a little, but what you really do have is a China challenge, just like we had with counterterrorism. Building and breaking out China structurally will allow us to address all of these other key challenges. And so when, when we do hold NSC meetings or you do have principles around the table, it should be very, very clear in each of those organizations what role they have to play on the political ideological level. If you go back and read, and I, it's my, one of my favorite sort of things I've read a million times and every time I read it I walk away with something else, is Reagan's National Security Directive 75. It was his plan to win the Cold War. It was a massive change from defense to roll back. And one of the key pillars beyond the economic policies that I think Tom outlines here was a strong focus on political ideological pushback and recognizing that, in fact, the two systems cannot compete and coexist. She is competing to win. And so we have to, I think, step back and ask ourselves, competition is a means, not an end. And if we tie ourselves into this notion that we're going to have endless competition, if we tie ourselves into some of the Cold War rhetoric that suggests this is going to have to be a multi-decade challenge instead of what I think we're in right now, which is a decisive decade, I think, unfortunately, we sort of convince ourselves that we, we can coexist. There is enough space for the two systems to exist side by side. But everything that she says privately in Chinese, in primary sources, in his speeches, doesn't indicate coexistence at all, right? And so it's very, very important to understand what the Chinese are saying amongst themselves and she in his own words. And if you spend the time to review and reflect what he has said from his first day atop the Chinese Communist Party, it becomes very, very clear that he isn't interested in coexistence at all. I think that's a very, very good uh, concluding remarks because it's a virtue of democracy to constantly point out our own inadequacy uh, without really pointing out, you know, uh, looking at the, uh, the, the other side. Um, I think, you know, um, uh, with that, we have a few minutes for, for a few questions. So, um, and, um, any tickers? Yeah, there. Sorry, you doing? doing great. I'm sorry. Um, this is an excellent panel, and I'd like to thank all of you because I'm really observing and I'm learning a lot. Um, I'd like to ask a quick question as far as more of a regional impact as far as the Chinese economy is concerned. And um, I very quickly read over your executive summary, Dr. Duisberg, and you really lay out some of the fundamental economic challenges that China is facing right now. Um, a, um, a tanking real estate uh, market, over leveraging as far as local governments are concerned, high youth employment, just to name a few. And I think that all these have got to figure into a not only a global strategy, uh, not only a global impact, but also a regional impact too. Now, when I was going to college back in the 1980s, um, I used to hear an old saying that said, uh, "That said, when America gets the sniffles, Europe catches a cold." Um, if we move this to 2023 and look at it from an Asia perspective. If China catches a cold, will the rest of Asia get the flu? And I'd like to hear some of your comments about that. Thank you. I think when China catches uh, sneezes, that uh, we catch COVID. <laughs> uh, well, uh, anybody? Yeah. I'll start. Um, I mean, China has a huge impact on, for instance, Southeast Asia. But a little known factoid is that um, the, the biggest investors in Southeast Asia, I mean ASEAN, are the United States and Japan, and Europe's third, China, well, China competes for being in third place. And I think there's a growing awareness um, in South Asia, ASEAN, India especially, um, that dependence on China is, um, something they want to reduce, at, at least. So that presents us, if you will, with an opportunity to in, increase our, uh, um, uh, our, our trade, our investment uh, with especially South Asia, but it also we, we need to think about Latin America as well. Um, whether or not we take that opportunity is, is another question. But when, when they 
China sneezes, it, it does have an impact. I think people more around the world more and more realize that it has an impact and there's an ongoing effort to uh, uh, reduce uh, vulnerabilities to the, to the Chinese economy. Okay, so um, what, maybe one or two more questions? Okay. Maybe one over here. Liz Laris, uh, Pacific Forum and uh, University of Mary Washington. And so the question that I have is this like ideological warfare. How are we going to do that? How are we going to engage that meaningfully with China if we are so divided in the country ourselves? You know, when I taught my China course, I would, you know, say to my students, look, China, because of Xi Jinping and, you know, the ability to essentially brainwash and get people to move forward altogether, whether they want it or not, yeah, they're moving forward. The United States, we're divided. You know, we're calling each other labels, and I'm not even going to say here. And, you know, I'd say, like, this doesn't end well for the United States. And none of my students could argue that with me because they know we're divided. So how can we engage in ideological warfare with China if we are divided? And then number two, very often ideological warfare turns to human rights. So we criticize China for its human rights record, but we're not able to change it or do anything about it. Go ahead. Go ahead, Craig. Eye yeah, contact. There's, there you go. There's two parts. Of it. I think it's a great question. And obviously, China is keen to weaponize political polarization and partisanship here. Even talk of the potential shutdown during APEC played heavily in Chinese social media and Chinese state media showing US dysfunction. So I do think that they have, they have developed and weaponized this broader narrative and information ecosystem that amplifies this message that we're unreliable and that we're, it's a mess here. And I think it is a mess here. I think, I think one of the things I always try to understand about how we won the Cold War a little bit for the you know, where there's value in making comparisons is, I look back actually what she says. She says that the Soviets lost the Cold War because their beliefs were shaken, their values were shaken, which is why ideology is such a central portion of his mass mobilization campaign in China today. But I'm sort of reminded that even amidst all of the political division and turmoil and challenges here in the United States during that time, during the Cold War, 1950, 1983 or so. Tremendous challenges that we were facing here, tremendous self-doubt. Uh, I mean, we had just crazy political and civil unrest. We still, through strong leadership, I think we're able to find ourselves on the other side of it. And I think, I'm hopeful, that maybe that political leader can emerge that will sort of, I think, calm some of the political waters here and I think allow us as we learn more about the China threat, and as people, the average American who I think is deeply concerned about just putting food on the table and covering their costs and dealing with their daily lives, learns more about what, what a world looks like that reflects China's values and interests, more and more people here get buy-in into how do we come up with a reasonable solution. The key challenge to all of those ideas, and Leland I think hits the nail on the head here, is directing them towards the areas that are absolutely most important today. A lot of this conversation is going to be driven by the Beltway, but increasingly, just like during the Cold War, we're going to have to expand this conversation, this broader public conversation, everywhere. And we have to sort of understand that, I think, and I was a baby, but I'll take it. During the Cold War, if you ask the average American to articulate the, the threat posed by the Soviet Union, its political system, its ideology, uh, its overseas activities, I think a lot of Americans could articulate that clearly. And so it's really incumbent upon us as policymakers here and through panels like this to help educate the American population to understand this is what a future could look like if China is at the head of the table. Is that really what we want, despite all our dysfunction? And I have to believe a little bit, maybe I'm optimistic, that that's a little bit of a unifying force here in our country. Yeah. Okay. Very, very quickly, I mean, I don't have the answer to ideological divisions within the United States. Uh, I'm hopeful, like Craig, I mean, these, these things, you know, in the long course of history tend to be a little bit cyclical. But w with regard to China, I think there is a consensus, something of a consensus, that what China does uh, economically is uh, something that is, in, in many ways, a threat to the United States. So. Um, that provides 
an opening to start looking at the, the sort of the larger ideolo ideological, if you will, human rights questions. And as we observe what, how China treats its own people, Xinjiang, but also how, how it treats people around the world that are uh, with whom they are engaged in economic programs. Um, and as they um, sort of give um, many forms of support to uh, aggressors in these conflicts that we have in the Mideast and uh, in the Ukraine, I think there's a, a, a recognition that that is something that is uh, antithetical to both the right and the left. So th these are elements that could go into, you know, a, uh, uh, a, a deeper, um, more values-based sort of recognition of what China is, is really up to. And I, I think there is a basis for uh, some consensus around those ideas. Let me just uh, uh, add a few words on that. That's a very good question. Uh, uh, somebody says that uh, you know a country is not conquered until it destroys itself. So um, and we have to have confidence in our own uh, system, and we have to believe our system is infinitely better uh, than the system represented by the Chinese Communist Party. That's number one, uh, and that's what uh, Craig mentioned. Reagan, Reagan has this, uh, this uh, unwavering confidence in the virtue of democracy versus the evil empire as he termed it. Uh, so um, uh, secondly, uh, I would say that. Uh, uh, about the uh, dis uh, divisiveness. I mean, uh, at no point in the history of this republic when this country is not divided. We keep saying this country is 50-50, that's true. So, but the one issue that's a, pretty much like a, there's consensus that's on China. So there is uh, uh, good news on that. So, uh, uh, finally, I would say that uh, uh, we hear about China's propaganda, the, 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 the awesome power of their uh, united front. That's true, not just Chinese Communist Party, uh, Chinese people. Uh, they often vote with their feet, and they always know they're, they're in profound disagreement with the Chinese Communist Party. So the key is that we have to really uh, uh, connect with the Chinese people. I often say that our relationship with China is never bilateral. It should be trilateral. Government, government, and also U.S. Uh, uh, people with Chinese people. And that will shake their fundamental. Uh, I mean, very few people in China believe, have the faith in the system represented by Xi Jinping. We have realized that. So uh, with that, um, and I thank all the panelists, and uh, most importantly, thank uh, Tom for your excellent research. And uh, this is uh, not just about the economic uh, issue, it's about something much larger. It's about uh, the, the fierce and uh, almost uncompromising struggle uh, between two models of governance. Which one will prevail is gonna affect uh, all of us. So thank you very much for coming, and thank you all the panelists. Thank you, Peter, all the way uh, from, uh, from Brussels. Thank you very much. Okay. Okay.